Uh, so our space did the preliminary feasibility study last fall. Uh, do we need one of these buildings? And of course, as we suspected, the answer was a resounding yes. Uh, that led us to step two, which was an arts market survey. Um, and that is a survey that was filled out by um, over 1,100 creatives in our community um, and a little bit beyond um, to kind of figure out what that building is going to look like. Um, so Peter put together this group of individuals. Uh, we partnered with Tempest Projects um, and we then contracted Artspace to do these to, to start working towards this goal. Um, so tonight we are here to hear the results of what those art, that arts market survey is and listen to a presentation from Wendy Holmes and Terry Deaver from Artspace. Um, but before we do that, uh, I'm gonna hand it over to Tracy Medulla, um, member of our steering committee and also uh, from Tempest Projects. Hi, thank you, good evening. Um, I just wanted to um, give a really brief note about what Tempest has done with this project thus far. Um, Tempest has been acting as the fiscal agent. Um, we did that through the um, feasibility study and the market study, but most of the people on the call know me because the major role that Tempest had in the beginning of this project was to rally up all of the artists to get them involved. Um, and so we've been really, really um, honored to be able to have that role in this project. Um, Neil sort of touched on this, but my other job tonight is to just give you a brief overview of what we're gonna do, which is we are going to hear from Artspace Projects and we're gonna get their evaluation of the survey results. Um, after that, we will have a Q&A with them um, during their presentation, you can put your questions in the chat. Uh, this way we can get to those as we go or you can uh, at the end or um, you can hold your questions and you can ask them at the end. And um, after that, uh, if you want to stick around and um, catch up with some people on the call and share what's going on in the community, um, we like to do that because we haven't heard from some of you in really long time. That's been, that's been one of the um, really fun things that I've been able to um, sort of participate in while we've been in this process. Um, before we get to Wendy and Terry, um, we're gonna watch a short video that was very generously created um, for Art Space Initiative by Lorenzo Cantera from, um, at Symphonic Distribution, which it's a great video. Um, Tampa is literally one of the greatest cities in the world and I'm so happy that the world is finally realizing that. To have Tampa Art Space come down here and actually um, help us get affordable housing for creatives would be phenomenal. I'm a visual artist and I paint giant pieces and right now I don't have the space to do so. There's lots of artists who need space and availability to create their art. Um, they might be living with people who don't support them or they don't have the means to get around. Transportation and getting around is can be kind of hard. I always have to make a commute because I can't stay too close to the cities because quite frankly I just can't make enough to actually live. Having that here, music venue spaces, art gallery and exhibit spaces, and also affordable living spaces, in any way that we would be giving them uh, would mean the absolute world to us here in Tampa. Beautiful. Such a great video. I'm so happy about that. Um, that's turned out so wonderful. Thank you. Um, so I want to, of course, you all are here to hear the results, but 
just before we do, before I introduce uh, our speakers, I want to also thank the elected officials we have here. Uh, Carrie Cohen is on the call, so thank you, Commissioner Cohen, for, for joining mm -hmm. us. I uh, really appreciate it. Um, and the, there are a few, I think, City of Tampa representatives as well. Thank you also for coming. It's uh, good to be with you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, and then without further ado, I want to introduce uh, Wendy Holmes, who's Senior Vice President of Artspace Con Consulting, and Terry Deaver, Vice President of Artspace Consulting, and they're going to go ahead and share the results with us. Thank you. Awesome. I also just wanted to say, uh, acknowledge our board member, Peter Lefferts. So when we come back, you can uh, see Peter again, but Peter has been integral to all of this and has been on the Artspace Board for over a decade. So thank you, Peter, for initiating our connections in Tampa. So we also want to thank, um, obviously, the Gobia Foundation, which Neil is the head of, uh, as one of the funders of this initiative, Bank of America, Raymond James, the Vinick Family Foundation, and then, of course, Tempest Projects, who was the fiscal agent and did so much more through this entire process. Thank you, Tracy and team, and Jessica. So we're gonna go through some slides, give you a teeny bit of background about our space in case you don't know us. <clears throat> After we're um, back together again, we'd love to know how many of you uh, responded to the survey, for example, and, and ask some fun interactive questions. So we were founded by uh, the city of Minneapolis in 1979. We're a nonprofit. We, we work nationally. We started in Minneapolis. We're based in Minneapolis and we work now all over the country. Our first project in Florida was in Fort Lauderdale. So just south of you. We now have 58 projects in operation in 35 cities, one tribal reservation in South Dakota, 22 states and the District of Columbia. And that's our Fort Lauderdale project on the left, as you can see. In addition to uh, the, the development work that we do, we do a lot of consulting and we work with arts districts, we work with cities on developing policy. We um, worked with Congress to adapt the language for the low income housing tax credit program to allow for a preference for people with artistic and uh, literary pursuits. So we do a lot of work in the policy making area as well as in the consulting area. Um, and then we have our bricks and mortar buildings that are filled with creative people. So our consulting process, as Neil and Tracy mentioned, it started with the feasibility study last year during the pandemic. It's all been virtual. And we learned through the process of, of how to do things better virtually. I'm sure you've all adapted to that as well. Um, so we did the preliminary feasibility study last year. We launched the market study this year. And now we're back to give you our presentation of findings. And a next step is what we're exploring and that's pre-development. So that's when you actually get into identifying a site, beginning to put the funding and the financing, identifying resources that can help you move a project forward. And these beautiful graphics that you're seeing were created locally um, by Jessica and you'll meet her later as well. So what did we learn in this uh, preliminary feasibility process? First of all, there's a scarcity of affordable space and that it's a barrier for retaining and growing your creative sector. Um, they be, may be moving to other places. They, they may be moving further out. Any new creative space project also must address racial and economic disparities that came out loud and clear. Um, it's both a sign of our time and at times and, and just a sign that that, has, that needs to be on the table from the very beginning. There's a dedicated local group of stakeholders that are really committed to making a project happen and that can make all the difference in the world. And that was very similar in Fort Lauderdale where we had extremely dedicated group of people. We learned that the creative sector is really deep. You'll see that in the numbers. It's diverse and it's eager to be more visible. It's eager to be something different than uh, St. Petersburg and is and acknowledged on its own. 
There are site and capital opportunities to explore more deeply in a recommended next pre-development uh, pre phase of work. And you can see some of the words that the artists uh, came up with in our focus groups together, underfunded, needs to be weirder, growing, disconnected, potential, sprawling, scrappy, talented, willing, hungry, a lot of very interesting words. Probably doesn't surprise you. So in, in doing this work, um, we wanted to test the assumptions, right? We wanted to test the assumption that a mixed use creative space project could be successful in Tampa. And we were testing the following types of spaces, affordable live work housing, public engagement community space, short-term and long-term creative workspace. And then we learned that the pre preferred locations were at least in the focus groups in the preliminary feasibility study were Tampa Heights and Ybor City. So we wanted to test those assumptions and you'll see more about that in a moment. So Terry, back to you. Yeah, so we, um, so with those assumptions in mind, we worked with Tempest and with the subcommittee of the steering committee that was focused on the market survey uh, work to put together a study that was representative of, of Tampa and was getting at a lot of these assumptions that we were hearing about. Um, and the success of this project, of any survey that we do in, in here in Tampa is really how inclusive are we? How much outreach are we doing? Who are we reaching? We wanna reach broad, we wanna reach deeply. And so we rely on the local community and your connections and your engagement and Tempest to do all of that. And as you can say, it was, see, it was like just a tremendous amount of effort that went out there from social media to news articles and flyers and meetings in person and online and just generating a tremendous amount of activity. Um, frankly, it's the best social media campaign and, and kind of shared graphics and such that we've seen in, in the 40, 50 plus surveys that we've done nationally. So that's just kind of kudos back to the community. Um, we uh, were online for about six weeks uh, collecting this data, collecting these surveys from folks at artspacetampasurvey.org. And so let's dig into some of the results. Um, so again, we had, it was, this is a, we've done these surveys nationally and this was the third highest response rate out of any community where we've worked. So you all really showed up, um, only topping you would be Los Angeles and Asheville, North Carolina. And as you know, those are also deep uh, creative communities. So it just really shows the, the, the depth of, of the artists and the creative sector in Tampa and the engagement around this process. Um, this is these this data on this screen right now is really about everybody who took the survey just to kind of get a sense of who was out there who responded and you can see that we've got folks from all cultural backgrounds um, life experiences there's veterans there's seniors um, we're really we're really happy uh, frankly with with the diversity of that outreach and we know because we know this is just a first step as well um, and it's usually kind of the hardest step in terms of reaching everybody and that this will continue to blossom and and uh, and, and continue to grow in terms of outreach as the project goes on so this is an amazing place to start um, and also geographically who took the survey, we want to cast a broad net. Certainly we wanted to reach you all that are in, in Tampa specifically, but we also wanted to reach to other communities where artists might have left, or artists might wanna come from, St. Petersburg, certainly one of the areas we wanted to tap into. And you can see that there was great success in that. So predominantly we're talking about artists that um, and creatives that are currently living in Tampa. So this is a reflection of your local community, um, but there's also those that have left that heard about it, maybe would wanna come back for an opportunity. Um, and you also were able to reach those that just have never lived in Tampa, but hey, we're interested in, in what was going on and interested in participating in the survey. So the key findings here, again, we've got this really incredibly high interest in space. So this really reinforces that the demand for uh, different types of creative space. 90% of those that responded to the survey were interested in one type of space or other, in some cases, maybe all three types of space. Um, as was mentioned, we asked about uh, live work housing. So the, for those of you who may not have come along with us on this journey or took the survey, just so you know, that is 
uh, was uh, defined in the um, world of art space, which is residential space that can also be utilized for creative work, whatever that discipline might be, whether it's writing or, or filmmaking or woodworking um, with high ceilings, natural light, um, uh, great for families and individuals alike. So that was that live work housing, uh, the studio space interest there in that private studio, that space that would be rented on an annual basis for some type of creative use, um, whatever artists and creatives were utilizing that space for, for making and, and, and sharing their work. Um, and then we have the shared creative space, which is essentially more um, specialized type of space and equipment spaces that could be accessed through a, as a maker space through a membership or on a short term basis. Um, you can see that there's really strong interest in all of these. We're really pleased with the percentages, that tied percentage there for housing and studio space is quite remarkable. Sometimes we see more of a difference between um, the different types of space, but all of these are greatly needed. Shared creative space there at the top with 58% uh, interest. And that is something that's pretty common. We see that nationally. That's sometimes it, it tops even higher than these others uh, than, than housing. And these are all kind of in line. Um, just if you want to do a comparative nationally. Um, so let's take, take a little bit of a focus then on those that said, hey, I'm interested in some type of, of live workspace. Um, we have really strong confidence in the market based on that 42% of folks that were interested in housing in particular. Um, we're also really thrilled again with the diversity, the cross section of people that are interested in housing. So this is workforce housing essentially, but it happens to be designed for the needs of the creative sector, um, because we were hearing again from seniors, from families, and when you start looking at those particularly interested in housing as compared to the overall respondents, um, they're a little bit younger. So these are folks maybe a, a little bit more in terms of their 20s and 30s, more of them by a percentage basis were interested in housing than the overall respondents or so emerging artists. Um, and a little bit more diverse, 42% uh, were non-white as compared to the overall respondents, which I think was more in the 30s or so. So that's was really um, encouraging again to see um, that type of response in, in terms of the housing uh, types of needs. Um, we really see this um, based on these numbers as an opportunity again to retain artists in the community. Um, you can see the data there. This is a really key point that of these, those that live in Tampa now and that are interested in housing, you can see that 76% of them have considered leaving the community um, in search of space and, and opportunities elsewhere. But 95% of them would stay in Tampa for this type of space. And that is just a really important data point to remember. Um, it's really that opportunity to retain your creative sector, your creative economy, grow the creative sector, and also still an opportunity to bring in some, some folks from outside the community who might have left but would like to come back. Um, we did ask, we got a little bit personal with those that took the survey and asked about their household incomes and household sizes. And we did this because one of the primary funding sources that we use um, helps us, it's a, the Low Income Housing Tax Credit, and it helps us to ensure long-term affordability of space. And so we want to find out of all those that are interested, who might qualify if on an income basis if we built housing using these sources. And you can see here that indeed, we've got a high percentage, 48% that would qualify with their households at 60% or below the area median income. Um, so these are folks that need below market rate housing. Um, if there's other types of opportunities of other funding to even raise that up. So it's still affordable, but still kind of below the market locally, um, you know, 80% or below area median income, we would get even more people that would qualify for this housing. So this is, again, just really um, indicative of a strong market for this type of project. And again, also um, for those of you who are in the affordable housing world and thinking about the workforce housing, again, you've got these creatives that are part of this workforce housing um, segment of the population that need this sort of specialized space. So looking at the focus a little bit here on the studio spaces, again, these are the spaces that would be rented on an annual basis to an artist or an individual or a group of, of, of folks that wanted to sign on a lease for that purpose. Um, it could be utilized for um, any type of, of use that might Maybe they want to show their work, maybe they want to be making things in there, whatever that might be, but there's a really strong need for private studio workspace. 
Um, and I think this is further underscored when you start to look at who these artists are. Um, many of them don't have the space that they need at all for, for doing their work right now. Um, and many of them, 63%, don't have dedicated space. So maybe they're sharing space um, in their kitchen or in their dining room or in their garage, and they'd like to put park their car there instead. So this is really just reinforces the deep need for working space um, in Tampa. So in terms of the interest in private studio space, the affordability is paramount, right? Um, we're looking at 36% that could pay a dollar or per square foot or more, which is not a lot of folks. Um, so what we're really looking at are people who need working space that can pay less than market rate. Um, in many cases, 45% you know, that can pay less than $200 a month. Um, you know, a dollar per square foot or less is going to serve more creatives in the community. Uh, we did note that a number of them would probably share space, maybe to make it more affordable for themselves and to have that type of collaboration. Um, but uh, but it just, just calls again into focus at the, the great need for space that is not uh, commercially available um, in these lower price ranges. Um, and if we're looking at spaces for working, work for working and creating the types of uses that might be happening in these spaces, so studio arts, exhibition, performances, so any new creative space, whether we're in a future art space type of facility or of other developers and property owners are seeing this and going, oh, wow, I didn't know this was a need. Um, I really want to be able to provide this kind of space. I think I can do this. You start to see maybe natural light, uh, zoning that supports uh, public events. Um, and higher ceilings, different types of um, amenities that would support these particular types of uses, uh, maybe some soundproofing, et cetera. The, the final focus in terms of space was this shared creative space, the specialized space. Again, this was the highest need, but really not out of line with uh, in, in relative to the other, the studio space and the housing. Um, there are certainly um, a great number of space types of needs. So that general use studio, the, the teaching or workshop space, rehearsal space, exhibition presentation space, these were all the most preferred types of spaces and specialized amenities. And one of the, the encouraging things about this list, I think, is that you know, these are not highly specialized spaces, right? These are not um, large thousand seat theaters with perfect acoustics. Um, these are spaces that could, in some cases, could be incorporated into flex space. And one of the things that art space does in particular would be thinking about when we're looking at this list is if we're incorporating some shared free space, let's say for residents in a building, some of these types of uses could happen within those spaces as well. Um, and to that point, um, the other thing we would look to would be folks in the community who maybe run a nonprofit or want to start a new makerspace business that want to provide or could provide some of these uses within space in a new art space type of project where they could rent affordable commercial space and then turn around and offer some of these types of programs and short-term spaces because art space and the work that we do, we provide the space, but we're not programmers. So that's part of that kind of community dialogue that needs to continue on. Um, but really interesting data around the types of shared uh, creative spaces that are needed in the community. Um, so we also asked about location. So location preferences, Wendy had noted earlier that when we were in our focus group phase of, of just anecdotal information, we heard that Tampa Heights and Ybor City were, uh, were preferences. But here you can see Seminole Heights and downtown also kind of rise to the top when we're looking at the responses from so, a much greater breadth of artists. Um, and we also acknowledge that it's important to consider these neighborhoods as a top priority for the reasons that they may have for wanting to be in these locations. Um, there's a lot of other factors that go into the feasibility of location, of course, as market being just one of them, but this is the place to start, right? Because we know that this is going to serve, serve the market. Um, we also looked at transportation, so location that would um, be accessible for walking, um, that we could allow for biking, but we also know that nobody's getting rid of their cars anytime soon in Tampa, and so making sure that there's still parking available for those that do have cars, but again, that we're helping people to maybe use their cars less based on the location, or we're able to serve folks that maybe don't aren't able to have a car or don't want to have a car and still need to access other amenities in the community. 
We gave uh, those that took the survey an opportunity to share with us their ideas um, of partners, um, folks that we should talk to, maybe future tenants, programs, um, cross-pollination partners. And this is just part of the list of what we heard uh, of the ideas that were coming from, from the creatives about creative space and creative happenings. And we look at this list and just think, okay, well, in next phases of, of work on a project, these are folks and groups that we'd want to have more communication with to understand what their space needs are, how we might be able to work together. And I would point other people who are looking at creating space or creating artists facilities and such also consider this type of list um, and, and who they maybe should be connecting with in the community. So what does this all mean? So we, this is a lot of data. It's actually really compelling data. But when we, we take all of that and we start looking at certain factors around you know, the affordability of space or, or what people can afford to space, what, what income levels they, they fall into, how many people from, an, from one household said, I'm interested in housing, um, so we don't want to have duplicate spaces within our demands. We, we consider all of this to come, what we consider to be pretty conservative. Um, findings and around demand, um, but it's still really, really, really strong. Um, so between 89 and 120 units of affordable artist live work housing could be supported based on this market study in Tampa. Um, this is assuming that the space is affordable to those earning between 30 and 60% of the area median income. If there are spaces that go above that to 80% of area median income, we'd capture even more um, opportunity for space in Tampa. Um, and I'm going to take this moment to remind everybody too that when we look at these this amazing demand that we know that one project can't serve all of this right and so um, just keeping that in the back of our minds when we're thinking about other opportunities in the community for so, so for addressing this need a um, hundred units of private studio spaces in addition to live work housing so if you build all that housing and you would still need some studio space creative workspace what that artist might be sharing they might be they're renting on an annual basis. Um, doesn't have to be huge space, 200 to 600 square feet would serve a predominant number of, of artists, um, but it does need to be affordable, right? That $200 a month or less would be kind of ideal, um, certainly no higher than 600 in general, um, keeping that at a dollar per square foot or less to make it um, accessible to, to the creatives in the community. Um, and then finally, that shared creative space. We think any facility should have shared creative space that's serving um, the artists in the building, that's also serving the public that wants to be interacting with the artists. Um, and certainly prioritizing some of those higher need spaces for teaching, rehearsal space, flexible performing space, audio space for recording and editing. Um, and that could be, again, some of that part of a mixed use facility. Um, it could be coming online in other ways um, through other developers and entrepreneurs in the community. Um, and that speaks to how, how can we use this information? As Wendy had uh, mentioned earlier, we take all of this to start thinking about project concepts. How big is the project? How many units can be supported? What's the mix of all of that? What are the rental rates? Um, you know, what kinds of specialized spaces. And so all of that starts to build a framework for building a con building that concept, um, looking at amenities that are gonna be serving those that might be residing in, in the facility. Um, and then we'd also wanna be following up again with that great list of potential partners um, for programs and for other tenants that are non-resident tenants in a project. Um, and again, we think this, all this information really needs to be shared with other building owners, with developers, space operators, anybody who's interested in advancing new space in any number of those amazing neighborhoods, for example, that, um, that are of interest to creatives. Um, those, you know, I think you're probably, everybody on this line, I'm going to guess, is in some way an advocate for the arts and for creativity and for making in the creative economy. Um, so we hope that this information is shared with policymakers and shared with others that helps to activate and create the infrastructure that supports space of this type. Um, and certainly sharing it too with the funders who are looking to say, how can I support the creative sector? How can I support workforce housing? How can I support um, economic development? Um, all of that is part of these types of projects. So we hope that this data um, helps to build that case and, and make people feel like they wanna be a part of, of this effort. So what we're recommending as a next step, because it's just such vibrant, amazing um, data on top of the original feasibility work that we did, um, is taking this information again, developing uh, 
through a pre-development scope of work, which is when they described as kind of when you start really getting real about a project, you start figuring out what exactly is it? Um, what's it going to cost to make it? Where's that money going to be coming from? Where is it going to be? Um, how do we bring an architect to do the design and then going after all of that capital funding to make the project happen? We see this as an investment um, to retain your creative sector, to grow the creative sector um, and the creative economy. Um, to, to be, I think it's always important to continue throughout any process of engagement of the creative sector, involving them in the process, being sure that diverse voices continue to be at the table, that that expands, because we know that, the, again, we're, even though it's so deep, we're still kind of scratching the surface. Um, but all of this also doesn't come for free. So pre-development fundraising is kind of the seed, um, seed funding. It helps to leverage all of that capital fundraising that needs to happen to build out a project. And that's kind of the next step that I know that um, our, our partners and friends there in Tampa will have more to talk about on that, on that end. And so with that, that is the end of the formal presentation and we are happy to open it up to questions. Um, well, before, if no one has any immediate questions in the chat or, or I don't see any hands getting raised, before we take jump into that, I want to go ahead and take a moment to thank the, the steering committee that really helped make this possible. Um, the steering committee is made up of uh, Aaron Abel, Tanya Brookhouse, Peter Lefferts, Tracy Medulla, Ned Pope, Lisa Reeves, and Michael Tomore. Most of which I think I think she, except for Tanya, I think Tanya and Aaron might not be here, but everyone else is on this call. So thank you very much. Without your help, it wouldn't have happened as well as our core group who really helped get the word out and helped us get those surveys filled. Uh, I'm gonna list those down. So it's gonna, I promise I'll be quick, as quick as I can. There's a lot of names. Uh, Jeanette Berrios, <laughs> Brad Cook, Edgar Sanchez Kumbas, uh, Emily Ghosh, Eileen Goldenberg, Andrea Graham, Cherie Greer, Alex Harris, uh, Wendy Lee, Robert Miles, Margaret Miller, Robin Nye, Paula Nunez, uh, Lisa Reeves, who's now joined the steering committee, was on our core group during this. Cynthia Rogers, Celino Roman, Emiliano Setacasi, Alex Sink, Annalisa Taylor, and Susanna Weymouth. Thank you all very much. We wouldn't have gotten this far without all of your help. I really appreciate that. Um, with that, if there's anyone has questions, please, you can use the reactions button at the bottom of your screen to raise your hand or just put it in the chat. Okay, Lauren Oberwerger has, a, sorry if I, I butcher the name there, I apologize. Will, will there be specific criteria for folks to be able to rent space, income, ethnicity, type of art, et cetera? Wendy or Terry? Sure. I can start it off, and Wendy, if you want to mm -hmm. jump in on that. Um, you know, in general, the, the projects that ArtSpace creates, um, as I mentioned, does use a low-income housing tax credit, which imposes a, um, a, a household income on there. So that's part of, of what we would look at. Um, we implement uh, a uh, process whereby we determine that uh, those that are applying are an artist and we provide a pre preference for artists in our projects. So it's not, we're not uh, looking at work in terms of, you know, how good is it or trying to compare work, but we're looking for commitment to the arts. Um, and th so that's around the housing piece of it. Wendy, do you have other thoughts on that? Oh, just that <clears throat> the funding tools that we use typically target people who are between 30 and 60% of area median income, which is determined by your county. Uh, so, you know, it's really middle income workforce housing uh, is what the tools allow you to create. And of course, that um, that income band is, is, a, is one that a lot of artists fall in. There's other kinds of space, though, that we like to create, too, and that's why it was important to ask about more than just housing, because the studio spaces are not income restricted, for example, or and the collaborative workspace. Mm -hmm. Maybe it would be helpful if you could also speak to, I mean, this question comes up a lot, is uh, how the residents are, are chosen. So how is that decision made about, you know, obviously there's going to be an application process, but so what's the decision making process that goes into that? Yeah, for the housing component, um, you know, it's all the typical background checks that you would expect for any apartment building. But beyond that, we, um, we ask 
people to check off a box on their application, whether or not they have a creative pursuit. And if they check off that box and the background checks are all good, then they're put into a pile. And those people are the ones that are interviewed if they income qualify. So th that interview means that we're asking not about the quality, like Terry said, but really about your commitment to, to an artistic pursuit or pursuits, your willingness to live within a community of creative people and your willingness to give back. And that's not a specific requirement. It's just something that we like to encourage and comes with being a part of a creative community. And I guess the question I was trying to, what I wanted to, them to hear was uh, who, uh, who makes that decision? Is that an arts-based decision or, or does that, is that made it more of a local level? So it, the committee of people who interview the artists has arts-based representation and then it has local representation too, typically the property management company. And then also artists who will not be living in the building that represent different disciplines and where there's uh, cultural diversity represented, that's the group of people that interviews the artists. Thank you. Um, another question that's come up on the, in the chat was, was ceramic arts and sculpture grouped into the drawing painting category in your survey? There was no 3D studio art listed. So if you have access, I, I assume we'll be sharing the report more broadly, you'll be able to see the full data set and the significant number of where sculpture was listed out separately. So painting and, and drawing really are folks that said I did the two dimensional painting and drawing. There were a lot of other options and there were also options for writing in. So they just weren't in your presentation? They weren't in the top, they didn't raise to the top. Yeah, so what was in this, in this presentation was were like the top three to five based on percentages and people could select three different because we know artists are very rarely focused on just one type of art form so artists were able to select three and that's just what rose to the top right. but, but we acknowledge that there are a, a ton of different types of disciplines and and that is actually part of what when wendy was talking about who might um, be interested in or qualifying in a project that we define that extraordinarily broadly. We look to artists to tell us about their creative work. We don't try to define creative work in, in any way, shape or form. Thank you. So there's a bunch of questions popping up now. Um, next question is your renderings showed what appeared to be new construction, but do you envision reuse developments? Uh, and then there's a couple of other after that follow up additional questions, but let's start with that one before we move on to the others. Uh, sure, I can take, we can kind of go back and forth, Terry and I. Um, <clears throat> we do new construction and historic preservation and oftentimes we do both together. And so it doesn't really matter to us. It's, you know, really what the community wants and is interested in and where there's available sites. So we have to be creative, right? In Seattle, we did new, new construction of three stories of artist housing on top of an existing building, for example. So that's possible too. Um, the AMI target, can it be higher than 60% AMI? Sometimes uh, there are tools that allow you to go up to 80% AMI and maybe even 100%. It's rarer to go that high and with the tools that are in the toolbox for that middle income housing. Although our fingers are crossed at the federal level that that might That's be true. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Sending legislation if you want to contact it again. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, so I'll, I'll jump to the, the next one, which was the question about um, our spaces being managed by a property management company of art spaces choosing. And I will say that we, we have an asset management team at ArtSpace that oversees all of our projects and stays very deeply um, involved with our communities in ways that you'll find that other maybe nonprofit and, and for-profit developers do not. Um, but we do have to hire locally um, for a local property management company for the day-to-day, -day, sometimes a site manager as well. Um, and we do with any of our, our partners in the project make that decision, um, but they have to have experience with affordable housing. So there are certain things that we're looking for to be able to, to balance both their experience in this type of um, regulated <laughs> type of management, but also that have a sensitivity and understanding how our, our work and our rules and regulations and, and, and activities are gonna differ significantly from what they would be used to managing in the marketplace. So the next question is, do we have a time frame in mind to make this happen? Uh, 
it's never as fast as people would like. And typical is three to five years. <clears throat> um, the biggest challenge right now is going to be to identify a site, a piece of property that is affordable enough to acquire within the context of creating really affordable space for artists that can keep affordable over time. So we know it's possible. We've done it in large, much larger cities than Tampa, but that is usually the, the sticking point at the beginning. Like in New York City, that was the sticking point. It took us a couple of years to identify a site. Um, that could be the case in Tampa. We're not sure. We hope it doesn't take quite that long. Okay. Next one's just a comment about Fort Lauderdale, which is great to see. Um, that you have a friend that has shared that decisions around residences have felt very collaborative and inclusive. It's a very happy group of tenants in or residents, I should say, in uh, Fort Lauderdale. So, anyone, anyone else have any any questions they want to ask Wendy or Terry? Or I'm happy to answer questions if they're specific to to the Tampa efforts that we're making. Wow, you guys did a great job giving information, huh? <laughs> there are multiple spaces in town available for art space to utilize for this concept. Does it have to be in just one location? Hmm. Go ahead, Terry. <laughs> um, well, I would say it's hard to do two at the same time. So it's, it's a significant <laughs> effort of, of funding and time and, and, and all of that. So kind of one at a time under art space, but I kind of go back to encouraging you all to share this with others, because I am sure that there are other property owners and developers who would be happy to, to address some of these needs, because it's, it's pretty significant for sure. Yeah, I know, you know, we, we've talked about this in the past that the, um, the likelihood is, is we're not going to be an answering the need in a single building. So we'll start with one and, and hopefully that'll lead to more. It could be like, you know, we have regionally in the Seattle area, how many projects do we have now, Wendy? Maybe four or five four. Know, outside, mm -hmm. outside of Seattle. So it's, it's, it's it has happened <laughs> outside of that. Yeah. For mm -hmm. sure. Here's some, um, some good questions coming in now. Uh, Ashley Williams would like to know about the process for those that want to build programming and maker spaces within mm. the We love that because that's what it takes. Artspace manages the buildings and we manage with the local property uh, management company, the whole building with a focus on the residential side, but the non-residential side is really meant for community creative businesses and they range. We have you know, in one project in Seattle, we have a Vietnamese preschool. Um, we have lots of creative businesses, galleries, frame shops, bike shops, restaurants, you name it. Yeah. So we love that. Um, what's the process for people interested in doing that? So once there's a building and there's space available, yeah. how, do you, how does that happen? It's usually about <clears throat> six months prior to, sometimes a year prior to, completing construction that we begin to do more of the outreach for the non-residential spaces. Although if somebody wants to, to, in, to let us know about uh, being a partner in this and having space in this building, it's never too early, never too early. All right. So give us your contact information. Yeah. And uh, the next question is, what's the average size for a living space in previous projects? Um, and that and it varies some. I would say on average, it's between maybe 600 square feet and 12 or 1300 square feet for so for a studio one bedroom to a three bedroom. It, it's dependent somewhat on the location, right, and the density and all of that. But we try to keep them large. We do keep them larger and more vol more volume than what you would traditionally find in the, in the marketplace. Yeah, and I encourage everyone to go to the artspace.org website. They have photos from most of their from their projects on there, and you can really see the quality of what they've put together in the past um, and details about each of those projects. Uh, another question, once a space opens in three to five years, what's the projected mm -hmm. annual budget and expectations for support from the local phil philanthropic community? Uh, that's an easy one. Uh, these projects all cash flow positively. Um, 
<clears throat> we put together an operating reserve and a capital reserve from the very beginning. So the 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 weight of the philan from the philanthropic community is on the capital side, not on the operating side. So they all have to cash flow. Otherwise, we wouldn't have 58 of them. Right. And and as as I think Peter Lefferts likes to point out, uh, that's 58 successful. None of them, you have not had a single failure in a building you've built. So um, knock on whatever. Right. So <laughs> that's that's just a, to, to that point. Um, do you ever work with local developers or property owners who want to donate small spaces to be offsite studios, galleries, or storefronts? What an interesting question. That's great that there might be interest mm -hmm. in that. Um, you know, for the facilities that we create, they they tend to be kind of in the location that they are. Um, we have certainly worked with developers in that context um, where maybe they're working on something, we're doing something in, you know, on the same site in some way or compatibly adjacent to one another. But I think we're open to all conversations at any time. Um, with, it's the kind of the big answer. Uh, so if there's something out there that you're thinking about or know somebody is thinking about, you know, we're, we're always happy to have that, that, that dialogue. Yeah, that goes back to every project's different. And so they all have, the, what what you use what comes in with comes with it and what what's available and what you can make work. Exactly. Uh, would there be a cap on number of people who rent a workspace? For example, if six or more artists wanted to take turns utilizing. So this would be for the, I'm assuming for the private studio spaces. I would I would assume so. That's what it sounds like to me. Yeah, um, no, I mean it's like a, a traditional lease in that somebody's going to be responsible for that and if they want you know, to share that with others um, in some capacity, that is that is fine with us. Yep. Any other questions or if not, we can start to talk about wrapping it up. Well, I just- I, I actually have just a quick question. Is the, is the report out publicly or will it be out we'll publicly? Be out. Probably, we'll probably put it up tomorrow. And if, um, you know, well, we can send it out. We have contact information for, I think for everyone who registered, we should be able to pull that down from Zoom and we can make sure that everyone who's on the call will get it first. Um, and then we'll put it available on the website along with the pushing the video out to social media. Um, and also we'll, we'll see about how we can get this recording because we recorded this to, to get this available to people as well. Um, so uh, will be, I just don't, we haven't planned the specific spot <laughs> uh, or spe specific methodology, I should say. Um, so thank you again, Wendy and Terry. That was fantastic. Um, okay. So I got an email that there was, I got a note that there's another question, but I don't see it. Um, Jessica, do you want to? Yeah, um, Eileen asked, would there be a cap on the oh, number no, I, of people? We asked that. We did. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Sorry. We covered that. <laughs> um, that's why I wasn't seeing another one. So um, thank you. Now, I want to thank you again, Wendy and Terry, for the, all the information and for, for getting us here. Um, and I just want to let everyone know how much we appreciate you coming here. Uh, you know, please stay on the line. Uh, the, the, we have a community conversation to happen after this. Kind of, if those of you who participated in the surveys and some of the social hours, I think that's how we're kind of envisioning it. Um, but before we leave, it's, it's important that we also point out that this next phase of pre-development does require us to raise some funds. So uh, there's a cost associated with that, and we have um, we have up to date. We've actually have commitments of twenty thousand dollars already. Um, from some of our core group and steering committee members. Um, and that was fantastic, gotten us, that's a great start, um, but we have a bit more to raise. Um, we have a total budget that we're predicting, the, the amount we have to raise for art space is 150,000. We're putting a $180,000 budget on that to raise, to be able to do this pre-development. That's the first phase of pre-development. So keep that in mind, that doesn't get us to construction. We actually have a much higher raise to, to get there um, the total amount that we need to raise to get up in, before we even can get to raising the money for the construction is is almost is about seven hundred fifty thousand dollars. So uh, we have a, a long a long way to go. If you are capable and you're able to, please donate. Uh, Jessica just put a, a link in the chat. Um, I, I hope you can. If if you can't, please spread the word that, that help make this happen. 
um, by, by getting people out there to know about it and, and, hope, and donate at that link. And without, if that's it, I think, uh, are we ready to move on to the community conversations? Tracy, are you ready to take over? Sure, sure, absolutely.